Shalom, my dear friends. Shalom. Today, the 24th day of the month of Cheshvan of the year 5778, corresponding to the 13th of November. And uh, today, once again, we do have some wonderful studies in the form of the letter Mem, as it's written at the end of the word in the Sefer Torah, the Tefillin and the Mezuzot. Another fascinating section of Shir Hashirim as we now enter the concluding third of this uh, most uh, profound, moving and uh, deeply encouraging work. And then we will go further, God willing, in our studies today of writings of Rabbi Nachman on uh, Lukut Moran, part 1, Torah 33. So with the help of God, let us with that begin now our studies of the Aleph Bet for today. Shalom, today the 24th day of the month of Malcheshvan of the year 5778, corresponding to the 13th of November of the year 2017. And today we continue in our studies of Mishnat Sofrim by the Chafetz Chaim, Rabbi Yisrael Kagan, our studies of the Hebrew letters, and we come today to the letter Mem as it is written at the end of a word, the mem sofi, the end mem so-called, which is the closed, the square mem, also known as the mem setuma, the mem that is closed, as opposed to the mem petucha, the open mem that we studied in our last session, as the mem is written at the beginning or the middle of a word, the mem stuma as we discussed in the previous section, which can be conceived as being made up of a letter Chaf on the right-hand side with the letter Vav now on the left-hand side attaching to both the roof and the base of the Chaf and uh, closed completely as opposed to the Mem Petucha where the Vav is angled slightly to the left so that there is a gap between the baseline of the Chof and the base of the leg of the Vav. So the Chavetz Chaim writes in the Mishnat Sofrim of the letters of the Aleph Bet, he writes as follows in his uh, teachings about the laws of the Memstuma. Memstuma, which is to be a breadth and a height of three kulamosim, of three nib breadths, that is to say that the upper roof is going to be the breadth of a nib and the lower base, the moshav, the seat, will also be the, the width of a kulamus, the nib width of the pen of the scribe. And the gap between the roof and the base should be approximately or a little over one kulamus, so a total height of three kulamusim and a total breadth of three uh, kulamusim. And the uh, Chavetz Chaim writes that the Mem Stuma Melchat Chila, that is to say, uh, from the outset, the way the Sefer Torah should properly be uh, written, the right hand corner of the Mem Stuma, like the right hand corner of the Mem, the, the left, the, the, the right hand corner should both be curved to emphasize and to uh, indicate that the Mem is made up of a chof and a vov in both cases. Uh, however, there's a difference between the top and the bottom because the bottom must specifically be squared both at the uh, top and the bottom of the mem setuma. That is to say that and also, as we shall see, on the right-hand side at the bottom, the Mem Stuma is specifically squared for a very important reason, and that is to make it clear that the Mem Stuma is distinguished from the Samach, which comes later on in Aleph Bet, which specifically has 
<clears throat> a, uh, a rounded base. In our illustration present on the screen, the roundedness of the base is not quite as clear as it should be because some of the illustration has been cut off. However, the base of the Samach is rounded and the right-hand base of the Mem Stuma is squared. So continuing now with the halachot of the Chafetz Chaim in Mishnah Soferim, that uh, if the scribe did not properly square the right-hand base of the Mem Stuma, so that a child saw it and the child confused it with the Samach, then that letter is Pasul as written in the Sefer Torah, the Tefillin on Mezuzah, because it doesn't have the proper form of the of the Mem Stuma. And there is an opinion of the Pri Magadim on the form of the Mem Stuma that it actually should be squared on all four corners, although that is not the main practice of our Sofrim today. But uh, the Prima Gadim writes this law that it could be or should be squared on all four sides to even further distinguish the Men Stuma from the Samach to make sure that it's no possibility of making a mistake between them. Now, this Mem Stuma has indeed to be closed on all sides as opposed to the regular mem at the beginning and middle of the word, the mem petucha, which as we saw specifically must have the gap between the vav and the kaf. The mem stuma has to be completely closed. And the roof of the vav here, which is attached now to the roof of the chof, the roof should extend further to the left. This is the head of the Vav, but it should not be extended too far. And uh, if it was extended too far and the scribe, when the ink was dry, scraped off some of the excess on the left, this would not actually uh, be considered to be violating the principle of chok toichois, where it's forbidden to engrave the letter by scraping off uh, the edges so that the black of the letter will stand out in relief. If the top of the mem was written, the mem stumat, with the roof too far over to the left, and the scribe scraped it off, the reason why this would not be considered to be a violation of the principle of not engraving uh, is because the essential form of the men stuma would still be on it. And uh, if in a, it, the letter could be corrected, however, the, interestingly, the Mishnah Sofrim writes here that if the mem stuma in question was part of a holy name, for example, in the Torah we have the name of God, Elohim, which ends with a mem, and the mem is a mem stuma. And if the scribe had written the roof of the mem too far extending to the left, uh, he would not be allowed there to scrape it off because that would be considered to be defacing one of the letters of the divine name. And bidiavad, namely if it was already done, and in such circumstances it could not be corrected, then uh, bidiavad it would be acceptable. After the event, it would be acceptable if it was in a... Uh, a, a tefillin or a uh, mezuzah or a sefer Torah. If it was in a sefer Torah and this error was discovered on Shabbat that the left roof extended too far, they should not bring out a second sefer Torah. This does not invalidate the letter mem stuma b'diavad after the event and it will be a disgrace to the existing sefer Torah if it were seemed to be invalidated on account of this. So here, my friends, we conclude our study of today's section of the Mishnah Sofrim on the letter End Mem. And we shall presently come, God willing, to our study of Shir Hashirim after a brief interval.
Shalom again, my friends, and back now to our studies of Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, now on chapter 6, starting at verse 1 and going through to the end of verse 9. And if we will look at the Shir Hashirim as it's written in the scroll by the Sofrim, we shall see that the although the chapter break in the printed uh, Bibles makes sense according to the context of the passage because we have ended in the previous verse, the end of chapter 5, we've ended the words of the uh, the beloved recounting the praises and the uniqueness of her lover. And uh, then the daughters of Jerusalem in the following verse, chapter 6, verse 1, ask, well, where has your beloved gone? Although there's a change of the person that is speaking in the previous verse from those who are speaking in the current verse, chapter 6, verse 1. In fact, in the Hebrew written klaf parchment, Shir Hashirim, it's a continuous passage because as we had seen earlier on, <clears throat> this whole discussion was initiated when the beloved was recounting the uh, uh, how how her love had come to her at the night and she'd been uh, in bed, she didn't want to get up, then she got up and then she was uh, uh, beaten and why asked her friends, why, was she, why does she swear to them to tell her lover, chapter 5, verse 8, that she is sick with her love for him? That is what, uh, as all part of this same long parasha that begin, began, with the uh, the verse, I was asleep and my beloved came, chapter 5, verse 2, uh, it goes on continuously now into uh, in what is in the printed Bibles, chapter 6. So to read our text now in the Hebrew and uh, to focus on the pshad, it is the questions of the love of, of the daughters of Jerusalem, can we join with you then if he is so unique? Can we join with you to follow him? And she says, "We are, I and he, we are completely bound up together and uh, he's in a place where you can't get to in his gardens. And this yearning and longing of the beloved for her lover is what elicits the next uh, beautiful and, and uh, encouraging praise of her by the lover in the following parasha, Yofo Ad Rayosi, beautiful, are you my beloved? Uh, which then uh, begins in uh, chapter 6, verse 4. So we're going now from chapter 6, verse 1, in response to that praise of the beloved Zer. That is my beloved, that is my companion, O oh, you daughters of Jerusalem. They turn to her and they say, Where has your beloved gone, you most beautiful of women? Whither has he turned? Let us seek him with you. And she says, no, 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 Dodi Yorad Legano, my beloved has gone down to his garden. La Rugo is Haboisem, to the banks of the fragrant herbs. Lir is Baganim, he's gone to pasture in the gardens. Ula Laket Shoshanim, he's gone to gather the, the flowers, the roses. And then she says, in the exquisite expression of love, which gives the whole tone to Israel's unique month of closeness to God, the month of Elul. She says, Ani Ladoidi, I am my beloved's, you have no part in this. Vadoidi Li, my beloved, it is unique to me, I am his chosen people. Horoya Bashushanem, there he is grazing among the, the flowers, the roses, the lilies. And uh, we have this most beautiful evocation in this pastoral environment of beauty of, of, of flowers and uh, fragrant herbs of her beloved pasturing there in this uh, delightful garden of his. So her 
expression of her loyalty, fidelity to him against the daughters of Jerusalem elicits his next praise, which is a new parasha. We here see the parasha break coming at the beginning of verse 4 of chapter 6. Yofo at rayosi, beautiful are you, my beloved, ketirza, you as beautiful as the town of Tirza, which before the building of Shamron in Samaria, as recounted in the first book of Kings, Tirza was the capital of the northern kingdom and a very fine and beautiful kingdom. And surely in the days of Shlomo HaMelech was already a most uh, uh, a beautiful city. Novo Yerushalayim. She is uh, comely as Jerusalem. Ayumo Kanidgolois. She is awesome. Like the Nidgolois, like the 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 uh, the legions with their their flags, their colours, and he says to her, "Hosebe enayich minegdi, turn away your eyes from me. I can't stand the uh, the passion evoked by your eyes. Shehem hir hivuni, they have lifted me up, they have elevated me." And then he goes into another praise. Your hair is like a flock of the goats that are sliding down the hills from the Gilad, moving so gracefully down the hills as seen from afar. Your teeth are like the the, the the lambs have come up from the washing. And here we see a parallel to verses that are almost exactly the same with a very minor exception in the his earlier praises of her when he was also going down uh, stage by stage back in chapter 4, beginning with uh, verse 1 of chapter 4. Get there again he said, your hair is like the flock of the goats uh, that come down from Har Gilad, Mount Gilad and your teeth are like a flock that have come right up from the washing. So the only verbal difference is that back there in chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Shinaich ke'ede orechilim. There in chapter 4, it says, Shinaich ke'ede hakitsuvois. Your teeth are like a flock all hewn out and uh, marked out equally. Here they are like an eider, like a flock, uh, like a uh, eider horechelim, a flock of the lambs. Also, they're the same expression that have come up from the washing. Shekulam uh, masimois, v'shakula enbohem, same phrase. They are all even and there is not a single one that has uh, fallen out, that is absent, that has been orphaned. There's not a single orphaned one among your teeth. And again, cons- uh, continuing with uh, not quite the exact order of the, ver- of the verses, but as in chapter 4, verse 3, it speaks there about the, 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 the slice of the pomegranate. Here again, like the slice of the pomegranate is your... Your your temples uh, behind your veil. Shishim heima malachos. There are sixty. Are they the malachot, the queens? Ushmoinim epelagshim. Eighty are the consorts. The difference between a queen and a consort is that the halachic status of the pelegesh is different different from the halachic status of an isha. The, the queen would be an Isha who was uh, married with Ktuba to the king. A Pelegish would be a concubine that does not have a Ktuba. Her status is, uh, is less exalted and less pure. So there are 60 queens and 80 con- uh, concubines. The Alamois Ein Mispar, there are maidens without number. Now, of all of these, he continues with her praise of her, Achas hi yoinosi, one alone is my precious pigeon, my dove, Tamosi, my pure one. 
Achas hili imu. One is she to her mother. The connection between daughter and mother, between Malchut and Bina. Borro hi loyoladato. She is clear, shining, translucent. Is she to the one that gave birth to her? Rauha vonois viashruho. The maidens have seen her and counted her happy. Melochoi sufiglakshim vihalaluho. And the queens and the concubines have seen her and give praise to her. So here, as we see in the script as written by the scribe, here at the uh, end of, ch- of chapter 6, verse 9, is the conclusion of a parasha, parasha stuma, closed uh, section of Shirashirim, even though in the printed Bibles there continues the, uh, the, 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 ne- the, the, there's a break after chapter 9, chapter 10, uh, ver- uh, chapter 6, verse 10, is actually a short parasha in itself, and then a new parasha starts at chapter 6, verse 11, and goes on continuously all the way to Anila Doidi Olai Chukosoi, I my Beloved, my beloved is mine, uh, which comes somewhat uh, further down in in the English printed Bibles. That is uh, going to uh, chapter seven. The end of the parasha comes at uh, uh, chapter seven, verse eleven. Anila doidi I am my beloved, and upon him is my desire. So today we shall be looking at the parasha of uh, the response of the uh, the section of the response of the Benosi Rushalayim to her praise of him, leading into his praise of her. So let's now bring up the text of the Mitzudat David commentating uh, commenting on this section of the uh, Shir Hashirim, the parasha that we have just looked at. Ona holach doideich. Where has your beloved gone to? When the maidens heard her words and how pleasant they were, they said to her, You, most beautiful of women, if you have not found your beloved in the city, then please tell us where has he gone? And which direction has he turned? This is saying, what is the path that he goes on so that we may go with you to search him out in that place? It's as if they are saying, if you are afraid to go alone, then let us too go with you, uh, accompanying you. And the nimshal here is, it's as if the nations of the world are saying, if it is as you say, that is to say that uh, he is completely unique, then please tell us, where is he? That is to say, how will you bring him back to you? And through what will he be conciliated? And let us help you in this task of bringing him back to give power into your hands, sufficient power to bring him back to you. And then we won't any more continue trying to swerve you aside from your going after him. And she replies, 
Dodi Yorat Leganoi, my beloved, has gone to his garden. It's as if she's answering, saying to them, well, his way is to go in the gardens. And that's certainly where he's gone to, between the banks of the fragrant herbs, to pasture and to wander around and delight in going around the gardens to gather the, the lilies, the flowers. I translate Shoshanim sometimes as lilies, sometimes as roses, because uh, different uh, authorities identify with those two different kinds of flowers, but Shoshanim is Shoshanim. That's what he's doing. He's gathering the Shoshanim to bring, bring them to me as a love gift to me, she says. And the nimshal here is that she is answering the daughters of Jerusalem, well, forever his way always was to let his indwelling presence dwell in the synagogues, the houses of prayer, the gathering houses of the children of Israel to pray, and in the houses of study of the Torah, the Batei Midrash, to search out the word of God. And to listen to the joyous sound of the song of the Torah and of prayer and to accept them with favor in order that the Torah and the prayer of Israel should be stored up with him in order through them to pay to Israel a good reward. And she is saying, therefore, it is through the engaging in the Torah and through my the prayers of Israel that I will seduce him into, I will persuade him to come back to me. So on chapter 6 verse 3 he says, as her conclusion to her explaining the uniqueness of him, that he's not going to consort with them and her devotion to him, she ends in this uh, beautiful conclusion of uh, chapter 6, verse 3, Anila doidi, I'm my beloveds. That means to say, just like all of my desire is only for him, so too all of his desire is only for me. And he is the one that is pastoring among the Shoshanim to bring me this gift. And the Nimshal here is saying that just as I have never chosen a strange God, so he has never abandoned me in any way whatever, such as to choose the pagans. And even now, he accepts with favor the activity of the study of the Torah and the prayer, which are guarded up with him, so that he will give to me a good reward on their account. So it is her response to the daughter of Jerusalem, her devotion to her lover, that now elicits in chapter 6, verse 4, his launching into his praises of her. Beautiful are you, my beloved, like Tirzo. When there was heard by the lover the pleasantness of her words and the extent of the extreme, the extreme degree of her yearning for him, he sends his words to her to praise her, to restore her soul. And thus he says to her, Beautiful are you, my companion, like the city of Tirza." And this was a city of very great beauty with uh, amazing buildings. And prior to the building of Shomron, Tirza was the city of the 
kings of Israel, the governing city, that is the kings of the northern kingdom. And uh, as mentioned, Shir Hashirim was written, of course, prophetically, but before the split of the kingdoms, but without doubt, Tirza was already, as a city in uh, Samaria, already a most fine city to which she is compared. And he continues with his praise, Novo Yerushalayim, she is beautiful, like the radiant city of Jerusalem, that she was uh, most uh, beautiful with the... Uh, the extreme degree of the way she is uh, ordered in her appearance and in her behavior. And he describes her as being ayumo kanid golois. She is awesome among the nid golois, the, 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 uh, those bedecked, those legions that are bedecked with flags. Says the Mutsudat Tzion, the companion commentary of Mutsudat David on the word Nidgalot, that it's related to the word for a flag, Degel, and it's referring the Nidgolois to the uh, camps that are adorned with their flags. So he is saying to her, on account of the great abundance of your high level, your importance, your, 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 your prominence, and the great level that you have, you inspire fear on those that see you. Just like the flags of many camps of soldiers that inspire fear upon all those who see them. And the nimshal here is to say, Even though you may have gone into exile, even though you may have been turned aside, for all that you are still most beautiful with your fine and worthy deeds and with your just and righteous traits. And all of the nations do not, in fact, want to destroy you Ultimately, because you are an abundance of uh, people and you're all most artful and learned in war. And he says to her, Turn your eyes aside from me. This too is from the words of the, her lover who is sending his words to say to her in a manner of affection. He's saying, uh, the, the, actually the Hebrew word in the verse, mi negdi, would mean from being against me. Hasebe inayich is to, to turn around your eyes here he's saying to her, according to Mutsudat David, Hachziri li enayich. Turn back your eyes to me because they have been Musarim, they've turned aside from being against my face, directly facing me. You've been looking away for I want you to look back at me because from back then, the time when your eyes looked at me, they strengthened and fortified my heart to be drawn after you. And here the nimshal is, it's as if the Almighty is saying to the sages who are the eyes of the assembly that they should even now look to him, that is to say, let the eyes of the sages look into the Torah and let them engage in the Torah, for it is through the Torah that they increase strength and have always done so 
uh, through our study of the Torah in our world, we add strength to the familia shel malo, to the, uh, the family or the assembly above, the heavenly assembly, through our spiritual endeavors in this world, the power of the spirit in the higher world is greatly increased. And even now, They, through this, through the study of the Torah, they shall be beloved to the Almighty, blessed be He. It's as if He is saying, even though they are now in exile, and the study of the Torah, when we are in exile, cannot add strength to the same degree to the heavenly assembly as does the engagement in the Torah in the land of Israel. Nevertheless, even in the exile, the study of the Torah does add to the power of the heavenly influences. Your hair is like the flock of the goats. So now again, as mentioned, these verses appear in somewhat similar form in chapter 4. And uh, the repetition of them indicates that we are now, according to our commentators, looking at the Israel in the restoration, the time of the second temple. And we shall see that coming through in his commentary now. Sarech Edor Izim, your hair is like the flock of the goats. The hair of your head is combed and uh, a glossy, shining, like the hair of a flock of goats that have been combed, as it were, and had uh, had some of the hairs pulled out on the branches of the thorns as they come down from the place of their pasturing, down from the Mount Gilad. It's as if they have been combed with a comb. And the nimshal here is to the uh, Nazarites, and this is like the commentary of Mutsudat David on the verses earlier back in chapter 4. It's alluding to the Nazarites who would grow their hair long like the flock of goats, and uh, the goats are, are combed, their hairs are long and hanging down. It's as if to say, even though in the time of exile there is no ability to bring sacrifices in the temple at the conclusion of the days of a Nazarite's vow and the mitzvah of Nazir being a Nazarite that cannot be fulfilled in the time when there is no temple. Nevertheless, they are still beloved before me. Going on in his praise of her in chapter 6, verse 6, Mutudat David says, the hairs, your, your, your teeth are like a flock of lambs. Your teeth are white in their appearance. They are all orderly and even, just like a flock of lambs that are coming up from being washed that are bright and glossy with a clear whiteness. These teeth, Shekulam Masimo, is the beauty of teeth when they're all twinned and even. This applies to the word Shinayim, this description, the word teeth, to say that all of the teeth are even, just like twins, there is not a single one that is a shkula, that is orphaned, where the tooth has fallen out, leaving an unsightly gap. That is to say, not a single one is lacking from them. Not a single one is has any kind of blemish. Not a single one has had its appearance changed. And the nimshal here, he says, Mutsudat David is referring to the Shotrei Ha'eda, the police police officers of the assembly, whose vital function in any system of true justice is to punish, to separate off, and to uh, quash those who are guilty in their law case, such that the Police officers are indeed clean. They are the teeth. They are the biting uh, edge of justice. They are clean without any exploitation, without any corruption, just like a flock that is coming up from being washed that are clean from all dirt. And uh, each one is equal to the other. They're all equal to one another in their righteousness. They're all holy. They're all 
cleansed of any kind of robbery. There will not be found in any one of them any kind of corrupt exploitation of others. He goes on in verse 7, like the slice of the pomegranate is your, your temples, the height of your face, he says, on either side is segalgal of Adom. There is the, 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 the faint violet together with the ruddy complexion mixed with the white. Just like the appearance of a piece that's been uh, cut off and come apart from the pomegranate. And these colors are hidden within, behind the veil. And uh, because of this, they attract exceptional love and desire, much more than had they been visible, revealed without the veil. And the Nimshal here refers to the Shoftei Ha'eda, the judges of the assembly, who are the face of the generation, that they are filled with every kind of wisdom and knowledge and understanding, just like a pomegranate that is filled with its seeds. And they hide their wisdom with modesty in their hearts, and they do not boast about it in front of people. As if to say, even though in exile the judges of Israel can only be appointed in accordance with the laws of the prevailing government, nevertheless, despite all of this, there will not be any of the leadership of Israel who will allow his heart to prompt him to step forward to become one of the judges unless there are found in that individual all of these virtues. Now the Metzudat David notes here that in our portion here, unlike in the parallel section in chapter 4, which was dealing with the situation of the first temple, here in our chapter 6, the verse does not mention her lips. He has not, he here does not mention the beauty of the lips as he did above in chapter 4 because the lips allude to the prophets as we saw when we learned chapter 4 and uh, the pro prophets do not uh, prophesy in the time of the exile after the, uh, after the time of the Babylonian exile with the exception of Ezekiel, who did prophesy in Babylon, but there was no further prophecy. There was only the Holy Spirit of Daniel and his companions and Mordechai and Esther. And for a brief period at the beginning of the Second Temple, there were the prophets uh, Malachi, Zechariah, and Haggai. Uh, but uh, the prophecy was uh, uh, largely lost and extinguished in the Second Temple. And on account of this, he does not here mention the praise of her speech, because that was alluding also to, uh, as we had in, the pre in chapter 4, where he praised her speech. Here he does not mention this, because that was speaking about the Levites who were standing on the platform in the temple courtyard to open their mouths in song. And in the exile, there is no temple platform and there is no song in the temple. And likewise, he does not mention here the beauty of her neck, because the neck, as we saw, alludes to the temple, which was in a state of destruction. And also, he does not mention the praise of her breasts, because the breasts alluded to the king and the high priest. And in the time of the exile, there's no king and there's no high priest. So now, as we come to the summation of his praises of here, we come to chapter 6, verse 8. Shishim Hema Malachi, 60 other queens. It says the Metzorat David, it would be reasonable to suppose that among the wives of King Solomon, there were 700 princesses. And among these were 60 that were 
quite exceptional in their beauty and in the in the in the 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 beauty of their character traits and among the 300 concubines there were 80 that were particularly exceptional in their beauty it's as if the chashuk the lover is sending his word to say among the wives of the king, those princesses, there are 60 of those who are so exceptional in their beauty and in the, the charm of their, of, of their traits. And likewise, among the concubines, there are 80. And besides them, there are many other maidens, all of whom are exceptional in their beauty. The nimshal here is coming to say that Among the seed of Shem, the son, of, the third son of Noah, with Yafet and Ham. From the seed of Shem, there came forth afterwards sixty nations, and these descendants of Shem, the principal families of Shem, he calls them the queens, on account of their being from the seed and the line that was most beloved in the eyes of the Almighty. And it was Shem who was blessed above the other two brothers by the mouth of Noah, his father. Now the seed of Japheth, his brother, also later became divided into 80 nations. And these he calls by the name of the concubines on account of their being from the seed of Japheth, Japheth, who was not as beloved to the Almighty as was Shem, but likewise he was not as hated as was Ham, the father of Canaan. Now the seed of Ham, their brother, afterwards became divided into nations without number, and it is these that he calls by the name of the maidens, without any further definition, on account of their being from the seed of Ham, who was hated by God and who was cursed from the mouth of Noah, his father. So after that praise in verse 8, we now come to verse 9. One is my dove, my pure one. One is she to her mother, pure is he, she to the one that gave her birth. The daughters have seen her and called her happy, fortunate. The queens and the concubines, they have praised her. Achas he, one is she. After all that, the, the nations, my beloved who is attached and devoted to me, just like the dove is devoted to her partner and the beloved is pure and sincere in her love to me, she is one, she is unique among all of them and it is impossible to compare them to her. And that's on account of her being one and unique to her mother. And she has made all of her purpose only to weigh the path of her ways in order to straighten her path with all strength. And she is pure and clear on account of the mother that has given birth to her. For her mother always put effort to, to cleanse her, to make her bright and shining, to, to, uh, to, 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 to rub off and to cleanse off with the cleansing ointments and uh, lotions of the woman. And the nimshal here is to say that the assembly of Israel is unique among all of the peoples because the source 
from which she has been hewn out were the holy ones, that is to say the Avot, the patriarchs, and the Imahot, the matriarchs. And it is they who planted in her heart the love of Hashem. And now concluding his praise of her, Ra'uha Bonois, the maiden saw her. When the maiden saw the purity of her deeds and the exceptional greatness of her beauty, they praised her, they counted her fortunate and happy. And when the wives and the concubines of the king saw her, they were praising her as if they themselves acknowledge that she has indeed gone up above all of them. And the nimshal here is referring to the wise sages of the nations, all of whom, in their heart of hearts, glorify Israel and acknowledge the truth of their praises of her. Well, it is here that in the written script of Shir Hashirim, this uh, parasha of his praises of her comes to an end, followed by a new parasha beginning in chapter 6, verse 10. Mizois hanishkofo kemoshacha, who is that that is appearing like the dawn that we will study in our next session. With that, my friends, we will now have a brief interval before coming back to the teachings of Rabbi Nachman in our next session after a brief interval.
Shalom again, my dear friends. Now we come back to continuation of our studies with turning to today's study of Rabbi Nachman's Likutei Moaran. And uh, we continue with our study of the teaching in Likutei Moaran, Volume 1, Lesson 33. Shalom, today the 24th day of the month of Malcheshvan of the year 5778, corresponding to the 13th of November of the year 2017. And we continue with our studies of Likuti Moran in Volume 1, Lesson 33, where in the previous section we had seen how Rabbi Nachman explained to us that all of the commandments of the Torah are themselves revelations of God's divinity in a form that is contracted. To summarize the previous section, we had seen how each and every detail of the commandments that God has given to Israel consists of its, its, its own details. As one strips away the veils that cover over the world around us and discerns the letters, the Torah, that would be found there. Uh, we see the letters of Torah and the messages that are coming and we learn that God has actually clothed his traits and his wisdom in the Torah and the 613 commandments God estimated and calculated in his wisdom and understanding that through each and every particular mitzvah we would be able to have some apprehension of him. And for that reason, God contracted, as it were, his godliness precisely into these 613 commandments with all of their details. God calculated in his wisdom that the commandment of the tefillin, the crown and the uniform of the male Israelite on the weeks, on the days of the week, the weekdays except for Shabbat and festivals, that this commandment has to be exactly precisely this way. Hainu Alba Parashio used to have to be the four portions of the Torah written in it, Shema Yisrael and V'hoyo Im Shemua, it shall be, if you will listen, the rains will come, and also a Kaddish, sanctify your firstborn to me at the end of Parashat Ba, and the passage immediately afterwards at the end of the portion of, of Ba in Exodus, when God will bring to the land, you will celebrate the Passover and practice the commandment of separation of the firstborn. Those four commandments, specifically with all of their letters, as we see in our studies of the Torah script, that every letter has to be written exactly in its proper form. The parshas, the portions on the parchment contained in the four capsules, Abba Botim Shel Urk Suvim, the four capsules of the head tefillin, which are uh, written, pinched out on the left and the right hand side, specifically the shin of four heads and the shin of three heads pinched out in the leather. Ritzuas shel or, they have to be specifically these these straps of leather. Kikach shir b'datoi shel dea mitzvah tzimtum azen uchal asigoi se or avdoi. For God estimated in his understanding and wisdom that precisely through this particular contraction in which the light is displayed, we would be able to gain an apprehension of him and to serve him. And the same applies to uh, all of the commandments. In the case of the tefillin, he did not command that there should be four capsules of silver or of gold. This was how he estimated and measured through his love of Israel for all of the Torah is an expression of his love for the assembly of Israel. Nimtso, it comes out from the above, the logical deduction is, 
שעל ידי הבוסו ישועה וסיסרואל, הלביש את עצמו במידוס הטוירו. Through his love that with which he loves Israel, he has clothed himself in the attributes and the measurements, the letters and the portions, the division breaks in the Torah. Nimso shebechol mido o mido yesh shom avo. The logical deduction is that in each and every midah of the Torah, each and every way that the Torah measures, in any sphere, the, to- the sphere, the Torah gives us a measure and a delineation of what is good, what is not good, what is pure, what is impure, the precise measure in which we have to follow to observe the Shabbat, the festivals, and all of the other injunctions of the Torah, all of them in each and every specific dimension of the Torah that is contained love that the Holy One, blessed be He, loves himself with Israel. A very interesting phrase here, that he loves himself with Israel. That is to say that uh, indeed God is a complete unity. And the love which he shows is the love for the manifestation, the display of his compassion, of his goodness. And this is accomplished through his unique relationship with Israel. Nimso mishemafshit es atoiro milavushi haklipois. It comes out from all this that the one who strips off the Torah from the garbs of the husks in the world of the forces of concealment and unholiness, the righteous is able to do this through bringing his material instincts under control. Then that person is indeed close to peace. As it's written, all of the paths of the Torah are peace. Now, a key aspect of our teaching here in the Likut Moran is that Rabbi Nachman is teaching us that everything is to be understood through the concept of veils and garbs, which both conceal a light that we are not able to receive, but facilitate the receiving of a light that we are able to receive. And uh, we see in this discourse, level by level, Rabbi Nachman is teaching us how to see godliness, even in the material world around us, how to derive messages of Torah from the actual material situations we face in the home, outside the home, in our bodies, in society, in our culture, on our earth, to understand that all is teachings and messages from God. And then he takes us up a level to tell us that the Torah that is concealed behind the garbs of the outer material world, the Torah contained there is itself in its various dimensions and aspects, a revelation of God's love for Israel. And now he's going to successively take us up to further levels to let us understand that there is a revealed love, but behind this, within this, the reveal, within the revealed love of the Torah, is concealed a higher love. The Torah itself has two aspects. The Torah has aspects in which it is revealed, that is to say the revealed words with their simple meaning of the five books of Moses, the prophets and the holy writings, the revealed aspects of the oral Torah, the Mishnah and the Talmud, All of this is revealed Torah, which has some bearing on the visible world around us. The Torah speaks in images of lands and uh, the skies, the heavens, the stars, the moon, the sun, the, the fields, the trees, the animals, and the different situations in which people are involved in our family lives, our social lives, our business lives. All the different halachot and the mitzvot of the Torah refer to these revealed aspects of life. But the Torah also has its hidden esoteric aspect, which is contained within and behind the outer garb of the revealed Torah. The Hanis Torah this hidden aspect of the Torah, and here we are talking about the same level which we discussed in our studies of Torah, Tesvov, 
in the first part of the Kutamaran, the teaching on the Ur Aganuz, the one who would have a taste of the treasured up light. This hidden aspect of the Torah, who eraiso de Atiko Stimo. This is the Torah of Atiko Stimo. This is a reference to the top of the main partsufim of creation, the main personae and visages through which God reveals himself to his universe. The highest of all of them is Atiko Stimoi, the ancient separated one that is hidden away, closed up. There is the revealed Torah which emanates from the aspect of Ze'er Anpin, the small persona, the small face. That is the Torah contracted to the level of Nigla, the level of the revealed Torah, which speaks in the language of men according to the situations of this world. But behind that is the true esoteric Torah, the Torah that is within, as it were, the concealed brain of the system of revelation. That is destined to be revealed in time to come. The revealed Torah, Zer Anpin, is associated with the Sphere of Tiferet. The uh, Sphere of Tiferet develops out of the wisdom of Abba and the understanding of Ima, Chochma, and Bina. And they in turn come forth from Keter of Atsilus, the crown of Atsilus, which is called Arich. Anpin, the long face, as distinct from Ze'er Anpin, the small face, and Arich Anpin, which is Keter of Atsilus, which is itself a partsuf, has its own Keter, and that is Atiko. And Atiko Stimoi, the brain, the inner concealed brain, this esoteric Torah will be revealed in the future when we shall be sufficiently purified of our physicality to be able to receive this. And then when this Torah of the hidden, concealed, exalted one is revealed, then the peace that will be in the world will be quite extraordinary as written in the prophet Isaiah chapter 11, the prophet, the prophecy speaking about the time of Moshiach and the, uh, uh, the, the sprouting of the branch from Yishai, from Jesse, where the, Torah, where the prophet says, chapter 11 of Isaiah, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard with the kid goat, they will not commit evil, nor shall they do damage in all of my holy mount, which is a far cry from quite where we're at today on the Temple Mount, where rioting and uh, assaults and attacks and violence are unfortunately all too common on this holy spot. But in that time to come, they will no longer commit evil, nor shall they do damage in all of God's holy mountain. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of God. For then the love which is in God's inner da'at shall be revealed. And now Rabbi Nachman is going to expatiate on this concept of the exalted esoteric Torah, which is going to be revealed in the future, which is revelation of the the love which it was in God's innermost intention to bestow upon us. There are different kinds of love. There are different levels of love. Sometimes in order to give a person the love you truly want to give that person, you have to first give them a lesser love, a love that is less manifest from the outside to prepare them. And Rabbi Nachman now deals with this, there are two kinds of loves. There is the love of God that is manifest in the days, in time. The good days, the not-so-good days, all are aspects of God's attributes being 
dealt out to us and they all stem from different aspects of his love there is a love that goes with each and every day with each and every manifestation of God to the world as was brought earlier in relation to the verse from Psalm 42 there is the day on which God commands his loving kindness where our sages dash in this verse to refer to the Yom Ozel Im Kul HaYamin, there is a day, namely his love, his chesed, that actually goes with and is successively revealed through each of the different days of creation, each of the different manifestations of his attributes, be it chesed, gevura tiferet, netzachod yesod, as they unfold through the days of our lives and the days of history. Shebechol yom, in each and every day, that is to say, in each and every attribute that gets revealed as time goes on, the attributes of the Torah that are manifest and revealed in the unfolding of events. There is contained God's love with Israel. All of this is the love that is manifested in actuality, which has actually been revealed. But there is another higher love that is as yet only potential. It has not yet been manifested in its fullness. There was a love and a connection between Israel and their father in heaven prior to the creation, for the creation came forth for a purpose. Its purpose was to reveal God's love and compassion. And it was for this purpose that the creation was brought into being. But those to whom he wanted to reveal his compassion and love are Israel. And therefore, in his the divine mind, as it were, the divine intention, there was a love for Israel that was present even before the creation which came to serve this love. When Israel was still in his mind, as it were, in his intention to create and in his brain. For example, there is a love that a father has in which he loves his son. Anyone can understand the love and the bond of the love that exists between the son and his father. I have uh, not read this correctly. There is the love the father has for his son. Everybody can understand that basic manifest love of a son for his father and vice versa. However, the love and the bond that existed between the son, the soul of the son, and the soul of the father when the creation and birth of the son was still only in potential, when the son was still in the mind of the father before his uh, conception and being given birth. And the Zohar teaches that the seed emanates from the mind and the brain of the father. This level of bonding and love between father and son prior to the birth of the son we cannot apprehend presently because in our time we can only apprehend that which is manifested within time and within the manifest emanations of creation. However, this primordial love in the mind of the Father, the mind of the Creator, is above time and 
manifest revelations through the attributes of God. And in it's not that this this primordial love is not garbed anywhere. For the Asid Lavosh is got a rise or it stimore, but in the time to come, when there shall be revealed the Torah of the exalted Atikostima, the hidden ancient one, the Asis Kaim Maimachamos Chachomenu Zichrem Levrocha, then there shall be fulfilled the saying of our sages of blessed memory, Asidim Tzadikim in future the righteous as the sages taught in Talmud Bavli Tainis Daf Lamad Aleph in the future the righteous will point with a finger as it's written in the prophet Ze Hashem Kivinu Loi Isaiah writes this is Hashem in whom we have hoped the expression is one that connotes somebody pointing with their finger this is Hashem for then the Holy One, blessed be He, will strip off His garments. The earth should be filled with the knowledge of God like the waters cover the sea. For Yiskaleho Avo Shibadas, then she should be revealed the love that is contained in the exalted knowledge and understanding of God. Shehi Pnimius Atoiro. This is the inner face of the Torah, the esoteric secret glory of the Torah. Hainu Elokusoi Hashuichim Betuicha Toiro Vamidos. This is the godliness that is dwelling within the Torah and within the attributes revealed in it. For in our time, this levush, this garb, covers over his godliness. The outer garb of the stories, the situations, the laws of the Torah cover over the interiority of the Torah, the esoteric Torah. But when the inner face of the Torah, the secret esoteric mystical Torah will be revealed, namely his intrinsic godliness as it is in the Torah, then peace will multiply. As it's written there in the verse quoted above, Isaiah chapter 11, they will not cause damage, they will not cause harm in all of my holy mount. Because the earth shall be filled with knowledge. That the higher level of love, the concealed love, the love that is in that, in knowledge, that will be revealed. And with that, my dear friends, we conclude for today our studies and with the help of God we will be resuming this coming Thursday at the same time 1600 hours Israel time on Thursday afternoon and with that my dear friends I wish you shalom from Yerushalayim, shalom from the holy city and uh, may have a good day, good times and advance steadily in the ways of the Torah and the service of God shalom from Yerushalayim